Good to be here. Good to have each of you here, and good to have Brother Kenzie and his wife with us. I know many of you have been looking forward uh, to having them back, and we're glad that time has come. Amen. If you haven't met these, Brother Buss and his wife, evangelists traveling all over. And uh, what I like about them, two things. One, the songs they sing, and two, the book he preaches. Amen. Brother Buster, come.
but he reached out his hand for me. Now my soul does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice. In the tempest to him I can flee. you turn let me say a few things about how honored we are to be here this morning and look forward to the week preacher was talking about our suitcases i was thinking he was going to say they weren't big enough to pack the kids in but we left them out in the trunk (laughs) they're not with us this week there are two of them the two teenagers are at, at camp starting tomorrow in in alabama and then our youngest Emma, she is with the grandparents and getting spoiled more. <clears throat> I didn't know you could spoil something that's plum rotten, but I guess you can. She's uh, there and she, someone's already asked how she's doing. <clears throat> she went through the procedure real well. They, Lisa and her were, uh, she was in the hospital. Lisa was with her from September, the, uh, the end of September to the middle of December. They were there in Greenville. And uh, they did the halo. I, I'm sure I mentioned it to you when we were here in July. They put the halo on her head and stretched her. And uh, then they put a rod in her back uh, before we, they sent her home. She straightened up uh, uh, about four or five inches. And uh, she goes, actually, she goes a week from tomorrow back to uh, Greenville, to uh, South Carolina, to the Shriners to have that rod lengthen they have rods they put in your back now that they can go as you grow and turn a screw or what have you and and lengthen that as you grow up and then when they feel like she's done all her growing then they will uh, finalize that however that's done but she is doing well they're all doing well and we're doing well and looks like y'all doing well so oh well amen (laughs) we're thankful for the goodness of the lord Thank the church for the another opportunity, Pastor, and the church for to be able to be a part of your revival effort this week. Thank you for the nice place to stay, wonderful, clean place to stay, and all your hospitality. Did I tell you Luke chapter two? If I didn't, that's where we're going to be at this morning. Luke chapter number two, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third gospel, the physician's gospel, if you will. Luke was a physician. <clears throat> he actually was the human penman of the book of Acts as well. Luke was a uh, was a partner. He accompanied Paul in a lot of his missionary endeavors. And we find his gospel, as I say that, his book that he humanly penned, the Word of God in the book of Luke. Very familiar passage of Scripture, kind of odd to be preaching from this, and a lot of people think it has to be cold and has to be poinsettias and and Christmas trees, but you can actually preach this in the hot July months as well. But we're not going to look at the story of the birth of Christ <clears throat> this morning. 
I want us to go towards the end of the chapter. The last few verses begin in verse number uh, verse number 40. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40. The Bible said, And the child, of course, that child being the Lord Jesus, grew and waxed strong in spirit and filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when, the, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, they departed. The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they supposed him to have been in the company when a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance, and they found him not. They turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? Amen. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. And his mother kept all these things or these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In our reading there this morning, this is a very familiar chapter in the Bible, especially the earlier parts of this chapter. But in this chapter, there are three occasions that Jesus is found. <clears throat> You'll find in the earlier chapter very what makes what is most familiar to us is in verse number uh, 14 or verse number 12. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And in verse 16, and they came with haste and found Mary, Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. So they find Jesus. That's the shepherds. Then I would submit to you that in verse number 30, there was a man in the temple by the name of Simeon. And Simeon, the Bible tells us, was waiting on the birth of the Lord Jesus. And uh, they bring Jesus into the temple after he was uh, of certain age, eight days old, by the law of Moses. And when they came in to do their sacrificing, they being Mo Joseph and Mary, they brought in, in verse number 24, you find they brought in their sacrifice, their offering, and they were a pair of turtle doves and, or two young pigeons. And there was a man in verse number 25 by the name of Simeon. And he was a good man. He was a a great man religiously loved the Lord but he had been waiting <clears throat> on Jesus' birth and in verse number 27 they bring the Lord Jesus and he takes the Lord in his hands and he in verse number 28 and he blesses the Lord and he says now in verse 29 let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. So Simeon finds Jesus. The shepherds find Jesus. 
But I want us to deal with this third event in this chapter where Jesus is found. This is his parents finding the Lord. They go to Jerusalem, and we'll cover these thoughts, but <clears throat> just to preliminary, they go to Jerusalem and they worship, they do their sacrifice and observe the Passover, and then they go home, or they begin to go home. And as they are commuting back home, they realize that Jesus isn't with them. And uh, they, they don't go any further until they go get Jesus. You know, it is hard to live life without the Lord. And you'll find throughout the Bible there are those that try to go on with life without the Lord being preeminent. I think about the whole nation of Israel. If you remember back in, <clears throat> excuse me, the book of Numbers, I believe it is, when they come to the Jordan River and there's 12 spies sent across to view out Canaan land. And they're going to go there and they're going to look at the land and bring back word and 12 come back. You know the story, I would imagine there's 10 that, that were doubtful. Ten that, that were discouraged. They, they promoted a negativity about Canaan. They highlighted the, the obstacles. And they highlighted the giants. And they highlighted all of the negative things. You know, there are negative people out there, aren't there? And uh, I'm not deme demeaning negative people. We all need them. But when your battery's dead, the negative don't need charging. It's the positive that needs the charging. So, uh, you know, in religious things, when it comes to the work of God, <coughs> we should never have a negative attitude. We should always be positive because God can do anything. We need to put our faith and trust in Him. But anyway, there are ten that come back negative and two come back positive. And you probably know this story where they say, we're not going to go in. We're scared. Our children are going to be prey. And so they decide not to go into Canaan. Well, after they realize their mistake, they have a change of heart. And they say, we're going to go. And Moses said, it's too late. You've made your decision, and you can't go back. So they go on anyway, don't they? And they are defeated. They try to go without God, and they aren't successful. There's another man in the Bible. There's numerous, but these are just some I'm just thinking about before I get into my thought. Samson was a powerful man, strong man. The story goes that Samson was told that the Philistines are upon thee after he had given his heart to the enemy of God and his hair was cut and his strength was taken from him. And Samson said this, I will go out as I have at other times. But he wished not that the Lord had departed from him. Right. He tried to go without God, and he was unsuccessful. And there's other people. I think about Job said, All that I knew where I might find him. Song of Solomon said, I sought for him, but I could not find him. And can I tell you this morning that we as Christians and you as a family and you as an individual, us as a collective body, as a church, none of us, none of us uh, collectively, individually can ever be what we ought to be. Neither will we be successful spiritually speaking or even uh, is speaking through about life, about finances, about, uh, about physical success. We'll not be what we could be. If we go without God, right. and we definitely will not be what we should be if we go in life without the Lord. Amen. 
I want us to look at the events here and give you three or four things. Notice, first of all, why I say the reason they went without the Lord. What could be possibly the reason they went without the Lord? Notice, first of all, in verse number 44, the Bible said, but they supposing him. Pardon me, my throat's dry this morning. They supposing him to have been in the company. Can I say the first reason I believe it possibly could have been they went without Jesus is in those first few words, supposing him. They could have went without Jesus because of assumption. They just assumed that Jesus was there. They just took it for granted that everything was as has always been. Why, sure, Jesus has been with us, and we just assumed that he is with us now. Now, Jesus' age, it is quite unique about this event. One of the reasons I think it's unique is because out of all of the years that the Lord lived, none of them are recorded in his earlier age with the exception of this. Also, I think it's uh, something to be noted that the Bible gives us his age. He was 12 years. If you know much about the Jewish custom, you'll know that that is a pivotal time in the life of a Jewish boy. They, that's the day of, uh, of the year of the, the bar mitzvah. That's the, the transitioning from a child to an adult. Nowadays, in our custom, that's about 50 or 60 from being a child to an adult. But in those days, uh, he was 12 years old. He was going from being a, a child. He would be given more responsibility. He would, he would take on a different role. So I would imagine that Mary possibly could have thought, because he's 12, that he was with the men. He's of that age where he goes with the men and, and is learning how to be a man and is, is drawing from the wisdom of the men and doing jobs that men do and, and uh, taking on responsibilities that men are to take home. Joseph maybe could have thought that he's 12 years old. He still hasn't reached the, the point now to, to travel with men. Maybe, maybe his mom needed him to help with some responsibilities that she could not do. Nonetheless, why neither one of them did, we don't know, but neither one of them did go and physically put their eyes on the Lord. Neither one of them physically touched the Lord and made sure that he was with them. They just assumed that he was there. And because of assumption, that could have been the reason why they went without Jesus. Can I say assumption can be a very bad thing? <laughs> just assuming in, in the practical things of life. Assuming one thing instead of verifying it can often cause trouble. Uh, it can cause trouble in various ways. I remember one year I was down in Texas in the month of March, and uh, I driven, I drove down there, and my wife called me, and she had, uh, she had gotten a ticket. She never has or had gotten a ticket until this time, but she was innocent, I'd say, somewhat, and the reason she got the ticket, she said, Buster, have you checked on the license plate? In Georgia, your license is renewed on your birth date. You want to get your book out? My birth date's in January, the 15th. Uh, but I, I, so it's March. I said, uh, you, that's your job. You know how that is. You pass the buck. It's what Adam did and got him in a mess, but hadn't learned. And I said, well, no, I haven't. She said, well, we haven't. We haven't got somehow in the shuffle of things. We, we misplaced or we threw away or we never received the, the little slip to get the tags renewed. And here it was, March. We just assumed that they were. I didn't go and look at that blazing plate and I didn't verify. That's a simple illustration to show you, as you well know, how bad assumption is in the practical things of life. Right. But can I say to you this morning, just assuming everything's okay with you spiritually is a lot more detrimental than making sure your license plates and your registrations pay. You see, a lot of people, they'll sit in church all across this country and around the world, and they'll sit there just assuming that their eternal destiny is set, but they've never personally verified and come to the Lord as a sinner and made sure that they knew without a shadow of a doubt that if they died, be their home. 
Just assuming being a member of the church will make you a Christian. Just assuming being a good neighbor will make you a Christian. Just assuming carrying a Bible will make you a Christian. Just assuming uh, going to church and being a member and participating in the events, none of that will make you a Christian. Assumption. Ah, uh, we could linger on with that thought, but let me just conclude this thought by saying, assuming that you're where you ought to be spiritually can be detrimental in your home. Right. You know, the, part, the bad part about assumption, we really don't find out just how bad it is on what we've assumed until it's too late. Right. You know, just assuming a certain thing, uh, practically speaking, you don't really realize just how bad it was to assume that until it's irreversible you can't do it i remember one time we had traveled uh, in this car that we're driving it's my wife's car and, and uh we were traveling home from somewheres close and uh and the gas light come on well it's a honda it's supposed to get 735 miles a gallon <laughs> So I drove home with the gas light on, and then the next morning, my brother and I, he was going to come to me, and we, I was going to preach a meeting somewhere uh, that wasn't too far, but I knew where I could get gas a little cheaper than where it was around that, where we were at. So I said, don't worry. He said, that gas light's on. I said, don't worry about that. We'll be able to make it to the station. And well, I assumed I could. You know when I found out I couldn't? I think you know when I found out I couldn't. When the RPMs went to zero. And I put it in neutral and rolled as far as I could. And he just sat over there and shook his head. I'm saying assumption is a bad thing. And assuming spiritually that you're doing what you should be doing spiritually, that you're walking with the Lord as you should, I'm saying it should be something we address on a daily basis. Lord, am I where you want me to be? Lord, am I, am I doing what you want me to do? We, should, we shouldn't just yield ourselves to God occasionally. I know there are services where God really speaks to our heart and we come to an altar or we, we, we kneel in our pew or we sit there and we commune with the Lord and we, there are little monuments along the life, or life's road where we do that uh, and, and those are special times, but I'm saying those shouldn't be the only times. Right. Every day we get up, every night we go to bed, all throughout the day, we should, uh, uh, we should be on our heart as God brings it to our memory where we say, Lord, I just want to give myself to you again and yield myself to you again. Just assuming it's a bad thing. Not only the assumption, but notice what the Bible says again in 44, verse 44. And but they supposing him to have been in the company. The company. So uh, not only assumption, but distraction. The Bible said they were in the company. In those days, they traveled in large groups. They didn't just travel like we do today in a vehicle where you can just travel with your family. They traveled in, you know, caravans. They would, they would all go in companies, groups, for various reasons, for safety reasons, for resource reasons, and, and just for uh, the distance. They're all going to the same place from the same area, and it just made logical sense to travel in companies. And I would imagine if it's like it there as it is at our place and probably at your place when you're traveling, there's a lot of commotion going on. There's a lot of things happening. You're making sure you got everything for some people, even the kitchen sink, and you're getting all of it packed and crammed into the car. And here they had mules and camels and all types of different things, and they're getting all this stuff together. It's a lot of hustle and bustle. They're going back home nonetheless. That makes it even worse. You want to make sure you don't forget anything. You forget something at home, you'll be back in a little while and you get it. You forget something in the middle of nowhere, you would never get it back. So they got a lot of stuff they're doing. And I would imagine it's some, somewhat chaotic. And possibly they got so busy with other things that they did not focus on the main reason they were there. I mean, why were they there? They were there to celebrate Passover. Do you know what Passover is? Passover initiated when they put the blood on the doorpost and the angel passed over and the death angel in Egypt and they did not die. That was a, 
a type. That was a figure of the death of Christ. That was, it was all pointing to the Lord Jesus. And John had already told them, uh, the, the angel told him that Emmanuel, God with us, it was going to save their people. Simeon even held up the Lord, even Anna in the temple. It was evident. And she, Mary and Joseph had heard that this was the Messiah. So Passover really was all about Jesus. But here they got, seems to, so busy on all the, the preliminaries that they did not focus on what really mattered. That's right. The Lord Jesus. I mean, they would have been all right if they forgot everything but had him. I mean, looking at it from the spiritual standpoint, but then looking at it from the practical standpoint. I mean, I don't know how your children behave, but I would hope that you would definitely would not want to leave them behind. I mean, that's, that's your whole world. That's all that some of us, some of you or some of us live for. So all of these other things really don't matter. All that really matters is the Lord Jesus. Amen. But they went without Jesus. I want to tell you, distraction's a bad thing. I've said it so often, I may have said it here. They, in certain states, maybe in this state, they have laws. It's about all the states now called distracted driving. You have to have hands-free things. Can't hold your phone. Or I saw this mechanism up here. I wasn't sure. If it was a GPS, if this thing launched off somewhere and you have to find out where you're going. You know, you got all of these gadgets and vehicles today. They want to make sure you're not distracted. Distracted driving's an awful thing. It, it's killed people. It's hurt families. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you this morning, as bad as distracted driving is, there's something worse than distracted driving. There's something out there that will hurt you more than distracted driving, though it is bad and though we shouldn't do it. I'm saying distracted living is a whole lot worse than distracted driving. And there's a lot of us, a lot of people, they go through life and they're completely distracted. You know what they're focused on? While well, there's a long list, it's probably uh, it's probably uh, infinite, but we don't have time to list them all. But I tell you, there's a few things that I find a lot of people are focused on entertainment. They're so concerned. Some of them are focused on education. Some are focused on recreation. Uh, I think about driving over here yesterday, went, going past these ball fields. Uh, and probably today, going past uh, Johnny and Sally and Susie and all the little children out there, mom and dad's out there, they're all watching them play ball. There's nothing wrong with throwing and hitting a ball. I'm not, I'm not demeaning that. I'm just saying uh, they'll do that on Sunday. Right. And really, that's distracted living. Right, amen. Thinking that all that's more important than living for the Lord. I'm going to tell you, you can be the greatest ball player that ever has been. You can have all of the fame. You can have all of the education, all of the materialism, all of the, the, the finances, and all of those things. But you'll never have life until you live life with Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Distracted living. You know, even those of us who are saved and want to live for the Lord, often we get distracted. True. We get all focused, don't we? Uh, we get we, we get looking at the wrong things and, and focusing on the wrong things. I have to constantly, the Spirit of God and myself, I have to make sure that, hey, you're getting distracted not by bad things necessarily, but just by things that aren't, shouldn't be more important than Jesus Christ. Amen. Distraction could be a reason. I've got to put a little bit more speed in this. Notice what the Bible says in verse 41. Now the parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast day. Notice uh, what the Bible says here. Uh, uh, let's see. They, 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 they accomplished the days uh, here in, in one of these verses. The Bible says, and they accomplished, they fulfilled. When they, verse 43, and when they fulfilled the days. So they went to Jerusalem, the Bible says in verse 41, every year. And then in verse 43, and when they had fulfilled the days. I say thirdly, the reason not only assumption, distraction, but obligation. That's right. 
You see, they did what they felt like they should do, and they should have done it. But they did it maybe with the, with the heart. I'm not going to step out on a limb and say something that, that shouldn't be said, but possibly they could have been doing it just out of routine or ritual. Right. Just out of obligation. You know, we are, we are people, creatures of habits. That's one reason why churches are low in number now than they were before all of the, 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 the events that we had last year. It, because some people were just coming to church because it was something they always done. They were just, they just, it was a habit. And when that habit was broken, they, they're not back. Obviously, that's not the reason for everybody. There are some that have legitimate reasons, physically reasons, and other ailments. But there are some in that percentage that did it just out of obligation, out of a habit. Right. Now that habit's broken, so they're not there. Can I say, for those that that apply to, they were just doing it out of a ritual. Their heart was not in it. They were just doing that out of an obligation, out of a ritual. I'm saying this morning, I should not and you should not be in church here because we just feel like it's something we have to do. That's right. We should be here because the Lord Jesus Christ came down to this earth, shed his blood, gave his life, rose again the third day, and the Holy Spirit of God convicted our souls, showed us we were lost. God saved us by the good grace, birthed us into the family of God, and we give worship him and to gather together at the house of God on the first day of the week and we did not come here to show off what clothes we have or to come here to make the preacher feel good or come here because it's out of an obligation. We came here out of a heart of gratitude because God saved us and we're a child of God and we would come here whether the church was full or whether it was empty. We would worship God because of what he's done for you and what he's done for me. That's why we ought to be here this morning. Because we are a child of God. The reason they went without Jesus. But then notice secondly, the realization that they were without the Lord. In verse 44, the Bible tells us, But they supposed him to be in the company went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. I, I, I see Mary and Joseph, we realized this morning that uh, can I use this uh, phrase? They were the cream of the crop. Mary and Joseph, they were, they were good people. Right. They, they were not just some half-hearted people. They were good moral people. They, they were godly people. But yet they made the mistake of going without Jesus. They, 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 they sought Him. You see, when they realized that they were without Jesus, they sought Him. Uh, and they, they sought him, and then notice, not only did they seek him, but they, they made efforts to do what needed to be done to get with uh, back to the Lord. The realization, I won't linger any more on that. I want to get to the results of being without Jesus. Notice the results. The Bible tells us several things. First of all, practically, the Bible says this, and when they, when they went a day's journey... They sought him among their, uh, their acquaintance in verse 45. And when they found him not, what does the Bible say? They turned back again. The result is, first of all, they made no progress. They turned back again. I mean, after all that they had done, after all the, the, the ground they covered, and I'm sure it's a whole lot more important Back then, the, the difficulty of travel, the, the pace of travel, the terrain and all of that, getting from point A to point B was a whole lot more to it than it is today. We get in our car and set our cruise control on, and, well, we're live on Internet. We set our cruise control according to the laws of the land. And, and we go from point A to point B pretty easy. 
you get out there on 71 and once all the idiots get off the, out of your way, you're able to go to where you need to go. You get on these side roads and, I mean, we, we got it pretty good. That wasn't how it was then. I mean, mountains and ridges and <laughs> deserts and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is, going from here to there a day's journey, that's a big accomplishment. That's something that you just don't want to throw out the window. They made no progress because they had to retrace every step that they made. It, it looked like they were doing good. It looked like they were getting to where they needed to go. It looked like they had accomplished some things. But in reality, without the Lord, they made no progress at all. That's right. No matter what they had done. Without Jesus, they, went the, they had to go back. Right. You know, you look at our world today and our world, they make such a big name for themselves. They want to talk about all the things we have. I get so sick of these politicians talking and babbling all of these things they say and and uh, the rest of the world talking about how we're doing. The truth of the matter is our world, our nation, even our society is going the wrong direction. That's right. And we have all of these gadgets and gizmos and and have all of these things but we're 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 not going anywhere. We're going backwards. Right. You know, our world was a whole lot better when we had a little bit, but the Lord was a lot. Amen. I mean, when our, when our nation would stand up and, and, would, and would call for a time of prayer, not just out of theatrics, but they pray back in the, uh, in the greatest generation, in the 40s and 50s, and, and even the late 30s, when they would, when they would honor God with their life, uh, they didn't have much. They didn't have the, the, the air condition and the padded pews and the fine carpets, and we didn't have all of the, the Google and YouTubes and, and all of the Internet and we didn't have all of the fancy things that we have today. But boy, I tell you, we had a lot of God, history seems to say. Amen. But today we seem to have everything but God. We're going in the wrong direction as a nation. But can I say not only as a nation, we have to be very cautious as a church and as a family and as an individual. Right. Now, we may have a lot of things. We may be going in the right direction, but we, we're going without the Lord. The Lord is not the one that's doing the next. Navigating. We just go as we want to go and consult with the Lord if we need something. Instead of saying, Lord, where, what would you have me do? They made no progress. I'm going to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what's in our bank account. It doesn't matter how many degrees are behind our name. It doesn't matter how, uh, how high we're climbing the corporate ladder. It doesn't matter how much lands and things we may own or how the, the portfolio may increase. If you're doing it without the Lord, you're making, we're making right. no progress. We look at religion today. Religion, you know, religion is growing. I see all these no-name churches, their crowds and things and so forth. My brother and I were talking. I've got two other brothers, and well, the oldest one's a pastor, and he and I were talking just the other day. We were talking about how religion is going and how it seemed to have been used to be, even in our few years of life back in the 80s, how things have changed in those few years. And you look at religion today, it seems like we've got less God, so we had to prop up religion with other things. We had to take, you know, God wasn't there, so we had to bring in all these fixtures, and we had to bring in all of this, this, this different music, and all of this different styles of worship. We had to drown out the the hollowness that used to be filled with God. We had to dry out, dry. We had to blast out that quietness. Right. If we just come like we used to come and God wasn't there, it would be evident. It would be obvious. So what did we do? We, we turned up the volume in the music and we, we got more activities going on because we had to do something to take the place of the Lord. That's right. And religion's going, boy, they're, they're growing by leaps and bounds, but, but God is not with them. I'm saying that it doesn't matter the size of the church. We've got to have the Lord. Amen. God's got to be with us. They made no progress. But notice what he says in verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? And behold, thy father and I have sought thee. And the last word is, 
sorrowing. Not only did they make no progress, they had no joy. Going without Jesus, they had no joy. They sought him sorrowing. Can you imagine how they must have felt? <clears throat> imagine how Mary must have felt being the mother. Not having the Lord. Imagine the failure Joseph must have felt. Being the leader and leaving his son behind. They had no joy. They sought him sorrowing. I imagine every tent they went to and every person they asked and every building they looked in and didn't see Jesus there. Their hearts grew heavier and heavier. Every corner they turned, every alley they looked down, and Jesus was... You know what brought joy back in their home? Jesus. That's what brought joy back in their home. You know, our homes, speaking collectively as the world, society, they're in a mess. I mean, uh, I made the awful mistake yesterday of going to an establishment, Walmart. I hate going to Walmart. I always vow I will not go back there again. But when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm traveling, I'm kind of stuck not knowing all the other avenues I can take. I can't stand going in that place. If you work there, God bless you. But I just don't, I mean, I'm standing there and all these people are hoard, all in this line. And there's 533 registers that are closed and two are open. And I'm thinking they're treating us like cattle. Like we have to come to this, this line. So I told Lisa, I can't take it. I walked out and got in the car. Let her stand in the line. <laughs> the men. There is no joy in the homes today. Just read the news. I read this morning. I, I didn't read a lot of news this morning, but I read this morning where a woman, I can't remember the state, uh, she is going to be tried along with her boyfriend for murder of a little three- or four-year-old, her son. She was trying to cover up what her boyfriend did. And I didn't even read the article. I just read the headline. And I, I, That's not just their vices. They're all in these homes. There is no joy in the home. Right. But I'm going to tell you this morning, you can sober up the home. You can detox the, the toxicated. You can get rid of the narcotics. You can get all of the vices out of the home. You can put them a, a couple and marry them, but still they'll not have joy that only Jesus can bring. That's right. I mean, you can testify. I'm sure those that got saved later in life, how that your homes were a mess, but when you got saved, God records. It's numerous times. Verse 48 mentions it. Verse 49 mentions it. Uh, and verse 44 mentions it. That word, salt or seek, seeking. Notice the restoration from me that Jesus, first of all, you have to seek him. They sought him. Notice what they did not do. They did not say, well, he'll catch up. They did not say, well, somebody knows who he is and they'll bring him back. You know what they didn't do? They didn't stand still and wait. They sought the Lord. Amen. And you know when they stopped seeking him? When they found him. And they didn't give up. I'd say I would have got discouraged, and I'm sure they got discouraged, thinking they'll never find him. But they didn't quit until they did. Seek. You ever played hide and seek as a child? I tell you, I got discouraged. I looked behind one tree and I was done. <laughs> that ain't the kind of seeking that we ought to be doing. You know, just one church service isn't going to do it. That's right. Just one revival service isn't going to do it. Right. Just one trip to the altar every once in a while is not going to do it. I'm telling you, we have to seek the Lord every day. We have to seek the Lord continuously. You say, oh, but preacher, I don't understand that. I'll tell you why it is. Because we live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked flesh. And we have a wicked enemy. That's 
And it never stops. We, we never get above the place to where we don't have to seek the Lord. Our hearts and minds ought to constantly be seeking after God. Amen. They sought him. And then they went back. We alluded to that earlier. They, they went back to where the Lord was. They found him where they left him. That's right. Every step they retraced. You know, they, uh, they, they went back where they seen him last. And, and they, they sought the Lord wherever he might be. They turned back. And you know, I'm glad tonight or this morning that the Lord allows us to come back. Amen. There are places in this town that says no U-turns on the streets. And sometimes that can be aggravating. You have to go around the block if you're a law-abiding citizen. But the truth of the matter is there's no place, there's no place that if we come to the Lord with repentance, that he doesn't allow U-turns. Right. They say, oh, I'll tell you, preacher, I've done some things I shouldn't have done. I've seen some things, said some things, thought some things, been some places. I, I, I don't have to know all the details. All that matters is that the Spirit of God spoken to you and you yielded and repented right. yourself to him. He'll let you come back. There's no sinner too far, no, no depth too deep, no sin too black, that if we come to the Lord Jesus with repentance, that he will not forgive and allow. They went back. And then in conclusion, notice what the Bible says. If you'll look with me here in verse 48. Verse 47 says there's those that he was talking to that were astonished at how he could understand what they were saying. And how that they were amazed at, or astonished at his, at what he was saying. But notice what verse 48 says. And when they, that's speaking again of Mary and Joseph. When they saw him, they were amazed. You know, not only they seek him and they went back, but they were amazed by him again. I would imagine that in the few years that they have been, can I use the word, associated with Jesus, involved in the plan of God to bring himself into this world, that there had been a lot of amazing events. Can you imagine what Mary must have felt like as a young maid when she was doing whatever she was doing, minding her own business, and all of a sudden an angel appears? says, Mary, thou art highly favored among women, and told her that Jesus was going to be her son in a miraculous way. I say that would have amazed her, wouldn't you? Amen. And then when he told her about Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, and she went to visit John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, and she began to talk about Jesus, and the Bible says that John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And, they, and she told Mary about that. I'd say that amazed Mary, I would imagine. And then can you imagine what it must have been like when Mary and Joseph earlier in this chapter had their firstborn son, the Lord Jesus, holding him, coddling him, and feeding him, and, and just, you know, just having a child in and of itself is a great thing, but now this was the Messiah and all that was going on. And <clears throat> they were there in that, that little stable, if you will, and all of a sudden the doors come open and here are these strangers, shepherds, standing in your door, their quickly made living room, bedroom. And here they are, people they never met. And they begin talking about being out in a field watching sheep and all of a sudden the sky lights up and these angels come down and it tells them that Jesus was born and the star has led them to him. And all of a sudden there they are. Don't you think that amazed them? Why, sure it did. And then a few years, contrary to a lot of Christmas plays, a few years transpire and they're at home and here comes these wise men, these wealthy men. I mean, there was no GoFundMe page back then, by the way. These wealthy men show up at their home, their humble home, a carpenter's home. These aren't high school dropouts. These are educated, well-to-do, well-renowned men come to their little humble home with these little gifts 
these great gifts, these expensive gifts. Wouldn't you think that would amaze her when she's moving a chair out of the way and pushing over a coffee table for these great men to come into her little home? Wouldn't you think that would have amazed her? But you know, it seems to me that somewhere between those events and now that she'd lost the amazement of the Lord Jesus. I'm not demeaning Mary and Joseph. I've already mentioned these were great people. But maybe they had gotten used to Jesus being around. And they weren't amazed by him as they used to be. And now they see him sitting amongst the highly educated, the, the schooled and learned. And he is amazing those men that everyone else was enthroned by. He is confounding the lawyers and the doctors, this 12-year-old boy, and all of a sudden they become amazed again at him. You know, oftentimes we get into rituals and things that we lose the truths of how great God is to you and to me. We come to church and the Lord speaks, the preacher preaches, the songs are sung and things are done. Somehow we, that can just become a habit, a ritual, and it doesn't amaze us like it used to be. Now that's what revival really should do. Revival should shake me and shake you to cause us to look at him and be amazed by him again. Yeah. It should cause us to realize, hey, you know, I was a sinner, and Jesus did save me from hell. Amen. Hey, the Lord is good to my family. The Lord has done great things for Amen. me. The Lord is uh, a, a wonderful Savior. It should cause us to get our eyes off of us and whatever it may be and get our eyes back on him like Mary did and Joseph did and become amazed by him again, again. I have uh, two brothers, as I mentioned. I'm the youngest. I wouldn't say I was the better of the three, but I wouldn't argue about it if you said that. But nonetheless, I'm the youngest of the three. And my oldest brother, I probably told you this before, but his first wife, she was real sick after they had their last child. And, and she, through different events, tragically passed away <clears throat> at a fairly young age. And here he was, he was a widower, and had a, he was pastor in a church, had a little small Christian school, and had two, two daughters. The youngest was probably, I don't know, six or seven. I don't, I'm not sure she was young. And while passing away and raising those children, of course, there was a lot of grief, and went four or five, six years, I believe, approximately. And uh, I began to try to find him a wife as I would travel. And uh, uh, I did. Uh, we was up in West Virginia, and long short of it, there was a young lady there his age. Her dad pastored the church, and she'd never been married. She's a good lady, had a great, uh, a great family. And, and uh, uh, they, they, anyway, they got married. And uh, they're still married, so Amen. feel good about that. I don't know how he feels or she feels, but I feel good about that. <laughs> so their first, they got married in April. I, it was around Christmas time that year. And uh, they live in a, a, a somewhat rural community. If they're going to do any big shopping, they have to go about 45 minutes away to, to the malls and all of those places that no man should go, bravely going where no man went before. But nonetheless, they were up there shopping. I called him that evening, asked him how his day was going, and he en enthusiastically and happily began to say all of the shopping they did that day, the stores they went to and the things they did. And, and uh, they weren't all hunting stores and fishing stores and stores that I would figure a man would be happy to go in. They were all these other types of stores, ladies' stores and these knick-knack stores that your man sits in the car and waits. But he was in there rummaging with her. 
and he sounded very excited about it. Hung up from the phone and shook my head and said, i tell you what, newlyweds. <laughs> but you know, I got to thinking about that a little bit more in depth, looking at it from a different perspective. You know, uh, what had happened to him was very tragic. It, it wasn't anything that was necessarily expected. It wasn't a long, drawn-out sickness. It was something that was, she was sick, but definitely didn't think it would be that serious. Then living there and with those little children, then getting remarried. You know what? He had something he thought he'd never have again. He experienced something he probably didn't really, when you're young, you kind of don't understand all that's involved when you fall in love and all that. He was able to look at it from a different perspective. And I, right. I looked at it, you know, he's, he got something back. Oh, it's not the same, I understand that, but he got something back that he never thought he'd ever have again. And he wanted to keep it. That's how we ought to be, of course, in marriage, in that aspect. But that's how we should be spiritually. That's what David said, Lord, restore, restore, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, I've lost it. You know, these car enthusiasts, they restore these antique cars. They try to bring them back as close to original as possible. And that's what it means when you think about restoring. You want to have that relationship, that love, as close as it should be as possible. Amen. That's what revival really is. Lord, restore to me that joy. Seeking Jesus. Are you doing that this morning? If you're lost here, can I tell you? He's seeking you. Amen. He's seeking you. And if you'll come you'll find oh, that He's all that you need. Dear Christian, maybe you need to come this morning and say, Lord, I want to be what I ought to be. I want to be what I used to be as a new convert. I want that joy again. Will you bow your heads with me? We're going to have an invitation. and We're going to play a hymn and give you an opportunity to respond to whatever the Spirit of the Lord spoken. If you're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I don't know for sure if I die today. I go to heaven. Why don't you come this morning and let us open up a Bible? You're sitting there, maybe even watching in home on a device. You're not a Christian. Why don't you ask the Lord to save you? Say, I'm a sinner. and Lord, I, <clears throat> I can't save myself. But I give myself to you. If you'll forgive me my sin and save me, I ask you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'd help us now in these moments of invitation. You do what only you can do. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. What, let's stay in our heads are bowed, eyes are closed while she plays a verse of invitation.